Good morning, McQuaid Jesuit community. And welcome to McQuaid's first ever and hopefully last ever virtual Xavier Day. My name is Christian Ruiz, and as many of you know, I'm the Service and Justice Director here at this group. Today, I'm privileged to welcome Mr. Shane Wiegand as our keynote speaker. Mr. We Mr. Wiegand is an elementary school teacher in the Rochettiana School District and co-founder of the Anti-Racism Curriculum Project. He has spent the last eight years meticulously researching lo local history with a focus on policies that created the residential segregation in our, in our area. His presentation will take a look at the systematic favoring of white Americans over black Americans and its impact right here in Rochester. At McQuaid Jesuit, we pride ourselves in forming young men who are loving, religious, open to growth, intellectually competent, and committed to justice. Mr. Wiegand's presentation hits on all five of those categories. If we are to be committed to justice, we must face the injustices upon which our city is structured, injustices that still persist today. If we are to be intellectually competent, we must acknowledge the history of our city and think about how we might help remedy past sins in our region. If we are to be open to growth, we must be willing to learn from the stories of racism most uncomfortable to hear in our communities. Lastly, if we are to be loving and religious, we must treat every human being with the dignity and respect they deserve as children of God, especially the African-American community, whose dignity has been and still is most affected by the racist policies of our history. With that said, I ask you to approach this presentation with an open mind and an open heart. Without further ado, Mr. Shane Wiegand. All right, am I coming in okay here? That's working. I want to thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here at McQuaid. The last time I was here, I think I was like 15, and I was at a rugby game, and I was screaming my head off. So it's great to be here in a much calmer setting, sharing some of the story. One of the biggest reasons I'm here is because about nine years ago, when I started teaching fourth grade, one of my students asked me during Martin Luther King Week if civil rights had happened in Rochester. If we had had the same problems we'd learned about with Ruby Bridges trying to attend school or Martin Luther King desegregating buses or demanding voting rights, were those problems things of Rochester? I grew up in Webster, and I never learned this history. And I think in many of our schools, we haven't taught this history. And so I started looking into it, like a good teacher does. And what I uncovered uh, became something that I realized everyone needed to know. And I started sharing it with my students, responding to their questions, and then slowly sharing it with folks all across the community. We're in 11 different school districts, and we've shared this with thousands of teachers and students to help them not understand the history, from my perspective, but to understand it from your own, to take a look at the primary source documents which show how systemic racism has shaped some of our community. But as I go through this presentation, I want you to, one, acknowledge I'm coming with my own perspective and lens, but I am gonna be sharing primary source documents. And as you look at these documents and the story that I'm telling with them, I wanna invite you to think, are these documents credible? What's the purpose behind these documents and what they did in our community? Um, what's the context for this period of time? What's the main idea? And what does this say about our community today? You'll see what I think, but I invite you to consider yourself. I look forward to hearing about the conversations you have as we dig into my presentation, Racist Policy and Resistance in Rochester. This is my team of teachers that have helped pull together what you're about to see today in these sources, um, a great group of folks from across the county who are helping tell this story. You're gonna see a lot of documents from Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law, the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle Archives, the New York State Commission Against Discrimination from 1958, the Oral History Project at the Public Library called Rochester Voices from the 80s, and a bunch of interviews with civil rights leaders who are friends and mentors of mine that have helped contribute also to telling this story. A quick level set before we dive in. Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, he gives us some language to think about these terms racist versus anti-racist. The key piece here being um, whether or not you are actively supporting racism or inactively allowing it to happen or um, actively fighting back against it. For most of my life, I would have been in that racist category, someone who wasn't actively fighting for racism but allowing racism to happen. Kendi writes, there's a problem with this term not racist. It's a claim that signifies neutrality, 
I'm not a racist, but neither am I aggressively against racism. There's no neutrality in the racism struggle. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There's not an in-between safe space of not racist. That claim of not racist neutrality is often a mask for racism, one that I certainly have worn. The thing is, in our community, racism has played a significant role in shaping it. We were founded by people who enslaved Africans, like Colonel Rochester, uh, Daniel Penfield, the town of Gates and Henrietta, Mount Morris, named for people who enslaved African people and used their for forced labor to build this community. But of course, people of color came together and fought back, like the great Frederick Douglass or Austin Stewart, who you can see on the right, who was enslaved in Sotus, New York, escaped to Rochester and opened his first black-owned business in Rochester, New York, as well as a spot on the Underground Railroad. And it was because of their efforts that slavery ended in New York State. And we're going to have to follow in their example, to come together, to name the racism that exists in our community, and organize around changing these things. Because the Hard Facts report uh, from 2020 tells us that black children in our region are more than four times as likely today to live in poverty that both African Americans and Latinx folks are less than half as likely to own their own homes as their white counterparts in Monroe County. When you take a look at all these other different data points, from household income to poverty uh, to child poverty to ELA proficiency, we see stark disparities along racial lines. When you take a look at this map that shows where people live in Monroe County, according to our census data, you can see that our suburbs are predominantly white, and especially that crescent shape or C shape in the inner city of Rochester is predominantly African American and Latinx. Our schools in New York State are the most segregated in all 50 states of the country, and the most segregating school district border in the United States is the borderline between the city schools in Rochester and the Penfield Central School District, number one in the country. In our community, white privilege literally can mean life itself. We're a child from Pittsburgh, predominantly white zip code, born today is expected to live up to nine years longer than a child from Rochester's previously redlined, redlined predominantly African-American 14608 zip code, a neighborhood we're gonna look closely at. Finally, when we look at the national stats around wealth, net worth, uh, white families have 10 times the worth or net worth of black families. Something that can't just be about responsibility. It has to be about something else, systemic reasons that are behind this that oftentimes in our community we have fel failed to tell the truth about, failed to have the courage to look at the root causes of this inequality, and that's what I want to invite you to do today. The thesis of my talk is these words from James Baldwin, who writes, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I want to invite you in joining me in facing these racial disparities and their root causes head on, the way people like Austin Stewart and Frederick Douglass did, and people like Howard Coles, whose daughter Joan is a good friend and on our board of directors. Howard Coles in the 1930s, he founded the Frederick Douglass Voice newspaper in that 14608 zip code. Um, and in the newspaper, he started chronicling what was happening, calling out the racism in banking and lending and real estate, finding that if you were black and tried to rent or own a home in Rochester, only two neighborhoods were made available, that Hudson, Clinton, uh, Joseph Avenue area of the city, and that uh, Clarissa Street neighborhood, uh, Plymouth Exchange, uh, also known as the Third Ward. He found that in these two neighborhoods where black people were forced to live, 30% of apartment units didn't have running water. His good friend, Dr. Anthony Jordan, carried on uh, his work in housing and connected it to health inequity, finding that the black death rate from all causes was 50% higher than that of whites, and the tuberculosis death rate among people of color was two and one half times that of whites and directly linked to poor housing. Similar statistics are very much true today when it comes to COVID-19. The Reverend Body at Mount Olivet Church in 1946, almost 10 years later, continued to speak out against the injustice in housing, saying the situation for people of color is an enigma in Rochester, where only two areas have been gracefully made available, and if any attempt is made to move out of these black ghettos, the attempt is met with opposition. And we're going to face specifically the opposition that people of color faced in the real estate industry with their code of ethics through the racially restrictive covenants on tens of thousands of homes in Monroe County. We're going to look at the 1934 National Housing Act and the redlining policies that came with it. And we're going to look at the movement for integrated schools and against integration in Monroe County that co continues to this day. A quick note about the period of time I'm going to focus on, it's the Great Migration. 
1910, Rochester had about 5,000 African Americans in the community. But by 1970, the population had exploded, largely due to people of color, over 6 million of them moving from the South to the North in search of better jobs, fleeing white domestic terrorism from the Ku Klux Klan and white citizens councils, and coming to places like Rochester, not to work at Kodak, where they weren't allowed to work, or Bausch and Lomb, but to pick fruit in our suburban and rural areas. And when those folks came to pick that fruit, How's that? Oh, we're back, my friends. I apologize. I haven't been in person in a long time. It's all Zoom life, you know what I'm saying? This is, this is bizarre and thrilling. All right, so if you're a real estate agent and you're selling a home, right, you have to follow this code of ethics from the National Real Estate Board. The National Real Estate Board governs all real estate agents, and up until 1956, the rules a real estate agent had to follow, and if they didn't, they'd lose their license. It explicitly said this that a realtor should never be instrumental into introducing into a neighborhood a character of property occupancy or members of any race or nationality that will be detrimental to the property values in that neighborhood. Howard Coles, who you met a few slides back, got his real estate license, and he started showing black people homes in white neighborhoods in Brighton in the 19th Ward. And very quickly, Frank Drum, the president of Rochester's real estate board, and his friends forced Coles out of the real estate industry preventing him from doing this. And they were incredibly effective at forcing African Americans into just those two neighborhoods. Dr. Alice Holloway Young, a good friend of mine, she formed, uh, founded Monroe Community College. Um, she was the first black principal in all of Monroe County in the 1962. But in 1957, she and her husband James, they're an upper middle class family. They have considerable means. They should be able to live wherever they want. But not a single bank would pre-approve them for a mortgage, and not a single real estate agent would show them any of the many homes that were available in the 19th Ward neighborhood of the city, a 100% white neighborhood. Dr. Young describes how she went to her friend, Harper Sibley, of the uh, Western Union Telegraph Fortune, who is a member of the NAACP, who bought her a house in the 19th Ward, lied and said she was her niece, and deeded it over to her in the paperwork. The Youngs moved in in the middle of the night. Again, this is 1957. They were terrified of the Ku Klux Klan presence that was significant in Monroe County. The next morning, they had death threats from the Ku Klux Klan with horrific racial epithets, threatening to burn down their house if they didn't leave. But the Youngs didn't leave. They stayed there for the next 17 years. And Dr. Young asked that when I tell her story, I mention the Bushes. They were the one white family on the street that stood up for the Youngs, stood with them, helped them stand down and face down the Ku Klux Klan, and lived there for the next 17 years before they moved to Brighton. We don't think of our community as a Klan town. But when you look at this front page article from the Democrat and Chronicle in 1926, 8,000 fully robed Klansmen celebrating white supremacy, anti-Catholicism, anti-Judaism, um, right there in what is today uh, East Rochester's high school football field. The next day, 20,000 of them marched down Main Street, fully clad in their robes. The next thing I want to talk about is racially restrictive covenants. This summer, I partnered with, uh, with Yale Law School's Environmental Protection Clinic, City Roots Land Trust, and a number of my students to go through the county clerk's office deed archive, where every home in Monroe County, the deed is public, anyone can go look, and on thousands of these deeds, there are rules. And many of these rules are benign, but some of these rules explicitly say that legally, a black person a Jewish person or an Italian person can't live in these homes. You can see there, number five, it says, this dwelling shall be occupied by persons of the Caucasian race only. Something you'd think you'd see in Mississippi, but was incredibly common in Monroe County. We have found tens of thousands of these. And it wasn't something done by just a few bad actors. The head of the county legislature himself, Clarence Smith, and the entire county legislature voted so that on every tax foreclosed property that the county came into possession of, racial covenants like this one, an actual picture of it, saying no person of any race other than the Caucasian shall use or occupy these buildings. The Catholic Church was involved. St. James Church uh, in Irondequoit, uh, the Bishop John Francis O'Hearn, agreeing to racial covenants barring African Americans from residing, occupying, or using these spaces. All along Oak Hill, advertised in the DNC. These are the actual covenants. 
Kodak put hundreds of these in the Brighton's Meadowbrook neighborhood, just next door to McQuaid, saying that not a single person of color could live in these homes. School districts like Gates put racial covenants under their schools, saying that children could, of color could not use those school buildings. There's over 2,000 covenants in northwest Irondequoit, that entire area by the zoo. In one of those homes, the racial deed was agreed to by the founder of Wegmans, Walter Wegman, who guaranteed that that racial statement was in it when he sold that home several years later, even though he didn't have to do it. The president of the Builders Association, Norman Huck, and the president of the Realtors Association putting hundreds of these whites-only clauses on homes they built. The head of the Bar Association. And I know I'm going overkill here, right? But I want you to see this wasn't just like a few bad actors in a few small places. This was something that was accepted, it was public, and it was done in front of everyone in Monroe County to design Rochester to be a whites-only place in much of its areas. But of course, like Howard Coles and Austin Stewart before him, people like Judge Reuben Davis fought back. Judge Davis later became the first black judge in Monroe County, and he described how he fought, saying, my wife and I were looking for a house in 1958. We saw one we liked on 135 Elmdorf in Rochester, just a block or so west of Genesee, that 19th ward where the Klan presence was significant. He says, I'd say there were probably four black families that lived anywhere west of Genesee at the time. The owner refused to sell to us because we were black, and there was a restrictive covenant in the deed that these houses, when built, were not to be sold to people of color or Italians. A quick note, Italians, Jewish, and Eastern European people were deemed non-white. They weren't deemed black, but they were deemed non-white, non-Caucasian. And that meant they were not full citizens. Legally, they did not have access to government subsidies to buy homes or to live where they wanted. But in 1944, during World War II, the GI Bill gets passed, allowing those folks to become legally Caucasian, whereas black veterans who served our country in World War II returned home and did not have the access to the billions of dollars in federal subsidies allowing home ownership for white veterans and white families like my own. This is his home, sold by Nothnagel Realty, preventing him from moving in there. But Davis says, I got devious. I was active at the NAACP. So a white friend bought the house, transferred it to me under the table. We had to go through those kinds of devious methods in order to find housing. And he says that his situation was pretty typical for the time. And when you look at this map, you can see the black spaces represent entire neighborhoods where every home has a racial covenant. Your researchers at the U of R are continuing to dig into this, and we estimate there are another 20,000 homes across Monroe County built before 1950 that have these racial covenants in their deeds. Now, this all began before the federal government actually codified these rules, making it the law of the land that if you wanted federal support to build homes, you had to have these racial covenants. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is not from Mississippi, who is from New York State, as president signed into law the National Housing Act the wake of the Great Depression, there's a housing crisis, so he passes a law that subsidizes over $119 billion in home construction and mortgages and benefits 35 million families like mine. But almost all of those families were white because explicitly written into this law, it said that if a neighborhood is to be stable, it's necessary properties be occupied by the same social and racial classes with a racist idea to justify it, that any change in social or racial occupancy will lead to instability and a reduction in values. Going on to mandate that deed restrictions, like the thousands I just showed you across Monroe County, must be imposed on all land that receives federal funding, prohibiting the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they are intended. I think there's some cognitive dissonance that comes up here. For me, I was taught racism wasn't in New York. Racism was in the South. Right? And when you see someone from New York, like FDR, who is seen in a very positive light by many in our country, there's cognitive dissonance. It's uncomfortable. It's challenging. And it certainly was for me the first time I learned about it. But Ibram Kendi, in his book, Stamp from the Beginning, gives us some language to think about this, challenging the idea that racism is usually done by the ignorant, challenging instead that it's something done by those in power to support their power, arguing that time and again, powerful and brilliant men and women have produced racist ideas to justify the racist policies of their era. Put another way, the ultimate goal of racism is the profit and comfort of the white race, specifically rich white men, for which I'd include myself, my father, and both of my grandfathers, whose wealth was built by the federal government. In the 1950s, both of my grandparents received FHA and VA loans that allowed them to buy homes in the suburbs. 
those homes, which were like thirty, forty thousand dollars, exploded in their worth. They sold those homes for hundreds of thousands of dollars. They used the equity and wealth from those homes to send my parents to college, to help send me to college. When I crashed my car as a first year teacher and had no money in the bank, I got a three thousand dollar check in the mail the next day to make those repairs so I could get into work. My stupid mistake becomes a stupid mistake. But for someone who doesn't have the benefit of generational wealth, those kinds of mistakes become tragedies. And we know in our country, wealth is directly tied to home ownership. And home ownership is tied to this federal policy that increased home ownership for over 35 million white Americans across our country. And one of the main ways they enforced this was through a policy called redlining, where maps were created by the government in almost every city of the country. You can go online and click on every neighborhood. I'll show you a few. But they were rated as uh, best to hazardous based on race and class. Green and blue areas were deemed best and desirable because they were 100% white, middle and upper middle class. Yellow meant declining, maybe immigrant folks or older homes, and red meant hazardous. If even one African American lived in a neighborhood, it was deemed hazardous. And notice where those neighborhoods are. You see those red line spaces in the center of the city, that 7th Ward neighborhood, that Corn Hill, Christa Street neighborhood, uh, and the Josana Little Italy neighborhood. Take a look at Corn Hill's assessor's report. This is what the government said about Corn Hill, why it got a red line rating. 75% black, 10% foreign and Italian, and incomes of $1,000 to $1,500 a year. Compare that to Pittsburgh, East Avenue Estates by Oak Hill, where every home has a racial covenant on the deed. 0% black, 0% foreign, businessmen, white collar, quadruple the income. Therefore, if you're white and you want to buy a home there, you can get a subsidized 30-year mortgage from the federal government and build wealth for your family. These homes are selling for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars today. Compared to my neighborhood in the city, Beechwood, it was 2% black, so it was deemed hazardous. This neighborhood today is over 70% black. Compared to Meadowbrook and Brighton, Kodak's whites-only neighborhood, 20 years after its construction began, still 0% black, 0% foreign, and rated green-lined or best. Every one of the suburbs was also green-lined. And to give you some scope and scale, in 1960, the DNC reported that the most integrated suburb of Monroe County was Henrietta, with just 11 individual people of color living there, led by the brave Dr. Walter Cooper uh, and his wife Helen, who challenged these racist policies and moved into Henrietta, facing terror and abuse, and moving in with a few other friends from the NAACP to move into sol solidarity. He didn't want to live in Henrietta, but he said he moved there because there was no other place to go, and the white folks in Henrietta were the least organized. So that's why the NAACP chose it. Richard Rothstein gives us some more national context for this policy, saying that this law ensured half of all new mortgages nationwide, and the majority of private mortgages during this 30 to 40 year period went out along these same racial and racist policy lines. The FHA and VA gave out over $119 billion in mortgage insurance, and over 35 million, million families benefited from these loans, 98% of them whom were white. The next thing I'm going to show you is pretty upsetting, um, and, but it's something that's a reality in our community. And it speaks to the culture of white supremacy in Monroe County at the time, and the clear welcome and desire amongst our white citizens and educational and religious institutions for wanting um, this kind of segregation in Monroe County. It shows some of the justification behind these policies. This is something called a blackface minstrel show. Every blackface minstrel show had a few main characters, a Jim Crow character, uh, a Zip C-O-O-N character, a Mr. Bones, an old black Joe, a Mr. Sambo. They would blacken their faces, paint on garish red lips, and dance and sing and these horrifically racist songs, mocking the intelligence of people of color, othering, just messages of contempt and hate, and clear statements of who's welcome in our community. But these shows were accepted by the community in almost every school and church across our county. This is 1960. Look at this picture. Front page of the Honeyway Falls Times. These Boy Scouts, these are fourth and fifth graders on their elementary school stage. All their names are listed. This was something that they were proud of. I mean, you would lose your job and your career for doing something like this. But take a look at the Catholic Church in Monroe County. Pittsburgh's Catholic Parish, St. Louis Parish, had an annual blackface show every single year up through the late 1950s. The CYA and the Immaculate Conception Parish had their annual blackface minstrel show in Monroe County, and I could go on. Fire departments like Webster's Fire Department had these shows. Kodak and GM 
Their executives would dress up in blackface and make clear who was welcome at their, at their factories and at their places of work. Almost every school in the city school district. Notice the Democrat and Chronicle publishing this horrifically racist image, but as a celebration. Look at this great thing happening in our schools. Look at what our children are learning. Allendale Columbia Private School in Pittsburgh partnered with U of R to put on these racist shows. This wasn't like backwoods ignorant folks. This is like the leaders and the elite of our community participating in these kinds of things. And you can see that these shows happened almost every year and were documented in the paper up until the late 1960s. How many people attended these shows are still alive today and leading our institutions and were socialized with these kinds of lessons as children? But of course, just like Judge Davis, Howard Coles, Dr. Cooper, Alex Young, people of color spoke out. They named this racism for what it was, they faced it, and they challenged it. Quentin Primo, the head of the NAACP at the time, wrote letters to every school and to the paper. One got published in the DNC that really gets at what's going on, saying these blackface shows must be banned from all public and private schools, churches, and public buildings. To do otherwise will cripple permanently the attitudes of all white youth involved in these community accepted shows towards all the dark-skinned people of this world. One thing that I think is interesting to note, after Quentin Primo called this out, local Catholics did join together to support this statement and acknowledge some of their wrong. Uh, on the DNC in 1961, uh, the Catholic Interracial Council called out this racism and called for it to change. Activists of color kept pushing back, and one of the things they got was a commission. New York State's governor, Governor Harriman, in 58, published a significant report done by researchers at MIT and Columbia that documents some of the specifics of how these racist policies impacted our community and continue to shape it to this day. They found that 80% of all black people live in just those two red line neighborhoods, the third and seventh ward. But if you remember the map from the beginning, that's where the majority of African Americans continue to live to this day in Monroe County. In these two neighborhoods, they found that more than 1,600 units had either no bathroom or a shared bathroom, and in more than 2,000 units, there was more than one person living in each room. This incredible overcrowding led people to take action in more ways. Constance Mitchell, carrying on the legacy of Susan B. Anthony, became the first woman and person of color to be elected to public office in Monroe County. She said that she ran to fight these redlining policies, saying, we were living in a community bursting at the seams because there wasn't open housing. When John and I bought our house in Gregg Street in the third ward, the agent told us, I can't show you houses west of Jefferson. They're not open to black people. So you were confined from Jefferson Avenue back to the river to look for a place to live on the west side of the city. Each of these two neighborhoods, still 20 years after Howard Coles had called this out, still did not have running water in 30% of their apartment units. Rochester, New York in 1958. People of color with more means started to challenge these racist policies in suburban areas. The biases, Dr. Thomas and Ermina Bias bought a house in West Gerondequoit. But quickly after moving in, uh, right in the evening time, the Klan started throwing rocks and bricks through their living room windows. This harassment and terror caused them to sell their home and join the Coopers and the Lees and Henrietta. But before buying their home in Henrietta, they had to sue the real estate developer because they wouldn't sell them the home on Gatehouse Trail because of the color of their skin. They won in the courts and were able to live there. The Tullivers in Brighton and Verena Drive, they tried to move into a house. Everything but the paperwork was signed. All the white neighbors pooled their money and illegally bought the house out from under them at the bank. They had to sue with the NAACP, and Mrs. Tolliver still lives in that home today. The Stubbs is in Greece. Ellen Stubbs, she started to get smart, one of the first black people to own a home in Greece in 1963. She got a white family of the same means, the same job, the same kind of background and class, and they went at the same time, just separately to that same development on Long Pond Road in Greece. Um, they get there, and the white family is shown multiple homes. Like there's three, four different homes available you could buy. The Stubbs show up, there's no homes available for them to buy. They sued and successfully won the right to be that one of the first black families to own a home in Greece. But these are just a few of the stories. There are tons of these stories in Monroe County of people of color fighting back or being denied in each of these areas. In fact, the report says that not a single FHA or VA loan was given to any black person in any suburb of Monroe County at least until 1958. Again, not Florida, not Mississippi, Rochester, New York. All of this leads to incredible amounts of protesting. 
people got fed up, much like they have this summer. Thousands of people protested in the street in an uprising, rebellion, or what some have called a riot in the summer of 1964. It lasted three days. A thousand people were arrested. 1,500 National Guard troops were called out to quell the protesting and sometimes violence against the police and the white landlords who had been discriminating against these families that were forced to live into these neighborhoods. County historian Vaca went through the arrest records and census data and found a direct correlation between those arrested as being folks who had been displaced from their homes because of urban renewal and highway construction, because they didn't have running water, or had been victims of police brutality. The next thing that's important to notice, though, is Rochester wasn't unique. In every city across the country, you have redlining. And in those redlined neighborhoods where African Americans were forced to live by design, people rose up in the streets in protest, in rebellion, and sometimes in riot. And after 1968, when Dr. King was assassinated, Lyndon Johnson rammed through the 1968 Fair Housing Act, which officially made redlining illegal. It banned racial covenants from being able to be effective or used. Um, and it gave people of color access to full citizenship for the first time in our country's history. This is 1968. But remember, for over 40 years, white families have been building the suburbs. Families like mine, whose homes in Greece exploded in value over the 20 years they lived in Greece before African Americans legally had the right to live in these communities. And people of color were being priced out of these places at this point, because they didn't own homes in the city. They had to rent, so they didn't have the benefit of selling a home to buy that bigger home in the suburbs like so many white folks did, like my own family. The other thing about the Fair Housing Act that's important to note is that the onus on enforcement was put on the individual. So you had to get a lawyer and sue, like the biases did, to have the right to live in your home. The government wasn't going to go out and actively suss these kind of things out, except for Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, uh, whose job was to take funding away from communities, highways, and sewer grants if they weren't affirmatively furthering fair housing. Journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones has found that only two times since President Nixon until Barack Obama were, was this law enforced where money was actually taken away from communities, when in actuality it could have happened hundreds of more times. And so this is a key piece, the lack of enforcement of this policy and the lack of bones behind it. The last thing I want to talk about is school integration. You might know this famous picture on the left of Elizabeth Eckford uh, facing racial terror for just trying to attend school in, uh, in Arkansas in 1957. On the right, you all recognize Ruby Bridges, right? being followed by armed guards, US marshals, to try to get her way into school. Take a look at Mon Monroe County. This is Rochester, New York. School integration starts to come in the late 1960s, quite a few years after in the South. At Marshall High School, 150 white youth and parents carrying sides outside the high school saying, black people go home and keep Marshall clean. Rochester, New York. This is a protest of white parents protesting school integration as black children are trying to go into school at Charlotte High School and Monroe High School. Take a look at these white parents outside of Charlotte High School in 1971 and 72, throwing rocks, stones, racial epithets, hanging um, black puppets from trees outside of the school, absolute racial terror occurring. The DNC reported on it, saying tension developed at Charlotte High School yesterday after three black girls were cut by flying glass on a bus that was stoned by these white parents and children. James Beard was one of the students. He was a senior at Charlotte High School and led the way in this integration movement. On the right, you can see the black student union that he organized with other civil rights leaders in the community that was formed to actually, like literally, protect students from the teachers and from the white parents who were causing them harm in the hallways and on their way into the building. He describes what it was like to take the bus out to Charlotte, saying, we were on the bus, we'd get to the graveyard on Lake Avenue. They'd hide in the graveyard, there was a wall, they'd come out from behind it throwing bricks, rocks, iron, anything they could find at the bus. They'd be busting windows and people would be screaming. The uh, anti-integrationists, they won. And then the next year, the city school district's board voted against allowing the integration plan to continue. And today, you may remember from the beginning, the border between Penfield and Rochester is the most segregated school district in the entire country. And yet James Beard, in spite of that racial terror and abuse that he faced, he says he still wouldn't have taken the experience back. Going to an integrated school where a majority of the population was truly a balanced mix of students, he says it taught him not to hate. 
he'd hated white people at this time. He didn't grow up around them. He didn't know white people until he met them and saw people as human beings. And white people, white students at the school became his friends. And they realized, oh, we're people. And they joined together in some of this fight. Some students chose not to, but he said that learning not to hate, building those friendships, gave him the skills and the tools that were useful for living in our diverse world. And he says that he was incredibly grateful for that. So when you think about all these policies, you look at the redlining on the left, and you look at the current census data on the right, you can see, I hope you can see, the direct connection between the systemic racism from federal, state, and local government, from the leaders of our local community who have enacted these policies, and you can see it's still impacting us today, where wealth continues to be hoarded in the suburbs as it was designed to be for white folks, and poverty concentrated in those redlined inner city neighborhoods. The same pattern follows for owner occupancy of homes, and you can also see the same thing when it comes to health equity. When you remember that statistic from the beginning, where children in the red line neighborhoods are living up to nine or 10 years less than white children in Pittsburgh, take a look at what's going on in these disinvested neighborhoods that were designed that way by the federal government. Food insecurity, asthma, the rate of uninsurance, high blood pressure, mental health not being good, and we start to wonder why do we have so many issues in some of these neighborhoods it's because we designed it that way. And finally, nationally, again, our wealth gap or net worth that families have, it's 10 times greater for white families than it is for black. It's going to take black families 228 years to earn the same amount of wealth that white families have today. Unless we decide to live out these words of the great James Baldwin, who says that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. It's my hope that you as young scholars and men in this community will carry on that mantle of facing this racism and carrying that torch forward, the way that we explored how Howard Coles fought back against racial discrimination and the real estate industry's code of ethics. He got his real estate license, showed homes to black people in white neighborhoods, and was forced out of the industry, but he stood up. He did what was right. He called it out in his paper. The way racial covenants were successfully fought by Judge Reuben Davis in the 19th Ward the way redlining was fought by Connie Mitchell, who ran for office, by Dr. Cooper, who physically moved into an unsafe space where the biases and stood there and refused to leave, demanding their right to live where they wanted to. And the way students like James Beard and the Youth in the Black Student Union at Charlotte High School demanded their right to an equal and integrated education in our community. And it's my hope we'll continue to carry that legacy forward. I hope that you've had a chance to look at these primary source documents um, to think about whether or not you see them as credible, uh, that thinking about the context of what was going on in our community and how it shaped our community today. And as we close, I want you to think about some of these questions. What were some factual information pieces that you learned? What stood out to you, things you didn't know before? What were the feelings that came up for you as you saw this about our community, or the cognitive dissonance, or the anger, or frustration, or doubt? Interpretive question, how does this information impact you? How does this connect to your story? Did your family benefit from these racist policies like mine did, or was your family negatively impacted? And then finally, now that you have this information, what are you going to do with it? How can this be a tool for allowing us to move forward and to continue this legacy? I want to thank you all so much for having me, and I'm really excited to spend the next five or 10 minutes answering questions, hearing your thoughts, uh, and um, engaging with you all in what seemed important to you, thinking about some of these questions. I'd love to hear your pushback, your feedback, um, or dig deeper into any of the stories that I shared from our history's past. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Shane, for that very thorough, at times, unsolid presentation, these facts. I, I want to invite, we have a few minutes maybe for a couple questions. If, if anything had come up, I can bring up a mic to those who might have a want to ask Shane anything. Hi, Shane. Thanks Hi. for coming. Um, my question is, you mentioned the Penfield-Rochester border as being the most segregated school district nationally in America right now. And is there an action say uh, Something called exclusionary zoning. Um, in the 1960s, uh, in response to the civil rights legislation, towns like Penfield, Pittsford, Webster, Fairport, they went from having very little zoning regulations, zoning means rules about how you can use your land and what can be built there, to having uh, white activists in Penfield and Pittsford 
demanding, restricted zoning, making it so that homes had to be a certain size and more expensive to price people from moving out from moving into those neighborhoods, and making it almost impossible for apartments or affordable housing to be built in these suburbs. If you look at a map of Rochester, you can see most of our apartments and rental units, they're in the city of Rochester. It's really hard to be someone who's working class and move out to the suburbs, or someone who lives in poverty and live in these suburban areas. And that's in part by design with the zoning codes. In our country, it's legal to discriminate based on income, and it's illegal to discriminate based on class. And the current zoning issues are absolutely there. In 1968, when Fairport, or Pittsburgh, uh, changed their zoning code uh, to having almost the entire land in Pittsburgh be R1 zoning, meaning huge lot sizes and no apartments or townhouses being able to be built. Leo Rhodes was one of the first black people to move to Pittsburgh and own a home there. Uh, he was a lawyer. He was one of the heads of the NAACP in Rochester. And in a letter to the editorial in the Democrat and Chronicle, he described what Pittsburgh was doing with its zoning and what Penfield was doing was akin to the racial covenants on the deeds that I talked about in the presentation. And that the zoning policies would create two separate Rochesters as you've seen in the presentation. So looking at those town comprehensive plans, um, examining some of that's going to be key. I think transportation is also going to be key. You can't live in the suburbs and take a bus to go to work somewhere. You know, like you have to own a car to be able to live in the suburbs. You know, and thinking about those kinds of things plays a significant role as well. So I think a lot of those things are going to be a part of it. I think reparations, and this is my personal opinion, has to be part of it. My family was given significant wealth from the federal government through home ownership and some type of reparation that allows significant access to home ownership in these suburban areas to black families to me seems only fair. When someone does something wrong, we can't just apologize. We have to make reparation and repair as part of that repentance. And to me, that seems like a key part. There's a lot of really great folks who are doing work around this right now across the community that are worth taking a peek at. Kevin Beckford is a good friend of mine in Pittsburgh on their town board who's been leading some of this work, Matthew uh, Brown, the deputy mayor in Fairport. Um, and then there are a number of parent groups in these communities who are trying to make sure that this curriculum, that this history is taught in schools. Um, if I had my way, I wouldn't be here giving a lecture. I would want you guys instead to dig into the primary source data, to look at the stats on racial disparity today, to really explore uh, the racial covenants in your neighborhoods and in the towns that you live in. Um, and to look at what the redlining map says, to spend time and ask those questions about credibility. And what we're doing right now with the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project is trying to help kids and youth do that. Um, not through a lecture, which I think is helpful to get the basics of this story, but hopefully to really spend some time with this history, to look into these people's stories and let their stories be heard in the way they resisted. And then own the parts of our story, like with the church's active involvement um, with racial covenants on these churches or blackface shows in these towns that made it so that people of color wouldn't want to move to a Pittsburgh when the Catholic Church there was having an annual blackface show at the town hall. That's a legacy that we can't just pretend didn't happen or ignore like we have for the last several decades. Some of the stuff needs to start coming out to light, and we have to tell the truth about it. So I hope that's helpful with your answer. And on that note, we've reached about 10.10, which is right around where we need to go to our next block. So why don't we give Mr. Wiegand one more round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for those who are tuning in remotely. At this point, you could be dismissed to go to your second block class uh, and go to your next six-period class. Thank you.